Hello, everyone. Welcome to It's Sybil. I am Sybil Wilkes, and it's the guy's day. Hello, Cameron. How are you? Hello, Sybil. I'm feeling great today. How are you? Great. Thank you. Hello, <laughs> Ned. I don't know if that is you freezing yourself or if it is. I'm good, Sybil. Thank okay. you so much for asking. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're so wacky. That's what happens when you get up at two o'clock in the morning. Oh, boy. <laughs> Holding it together. Okay. My string. <laughs> okay. I understand. And uh, Damon, the ever incredible, how are you? Uh, thank you for that, Steve. Well, I'm doing great. And if, if you get up at two in the morning, you're either wacky or you need the smacky. <laughs> <laughs> Running through your veins. Yeah, I was going to uh, say. Morning, Is that precious? <laughs> okay. The crack is whack. Awesome. How's everybody doing? Awesome you all snack. sound in good spirits. Everybody good? Yeah. 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 It's been one hell of a day. Or yeah, well, it's just, been it. Yeah. Yeah. The 24 hours, I guess. It's mm -hmm. been crazy. Yeah. So, you know. It's one of those news days, Ned, that you know, people are like, oh, I love, I love when things are happening and, and everything like that. But uh the tragedy of it all also yeah. affects you as well as needing to, you know, update and, and to get all the, the news right and get it in. Uh, so that Ooh, it's, that, it's, yeah, it's that is, lot. that is a lot. And it's, it's funny uh, doing the morning show again and being in this position because the team, my team saw me today in, in a prime producer mode where I was mm -hmm. like, Ooh, the juices are flowing. <laughs> I got, Cause I got on the phone with the press secretary of uh, the mayor, uh, the governor of Maryland at like mm -hmm. five thirty in the morning. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, you answered your cell phone. That's amazing. Right. Right. <laughs> I was right. like, so having those conversations this morning, trying to get somebody on, and you know, re getting responses from the White House saying, yeah, we're trying to figure out who to put on. I'm like, where's Pete? Right. <laughs> like, right. Where's, where's Pete? So it was a lot of that this morning because coming in this morning and it happening at one thirty. You know what? I know we're going to talk about it. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Oh no, no. Uh, but uh, giving people a little bit of behind the scenes kind of stuff. And yeah. uh, Damon, how are you? Doing well. Uh, I was up, I, and I was, Roland Martin posted the, the yep. bridge collapse, and I was like, "Whoa!" It felt like it was like somebody was pranking it. You know, it's like mm -hmm. you know that's fake. So to see that in real time or almost real time was was uh, crazy. I'm good. I'm on my way to Edmonton uh, to hang out with my peoples out there this week. I leave tomorrow for two days, and I'll be back Friday at home this weekend with um, Coco Brown. You know, we're doing that fundraiser for her, so right. everything's cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, Roland must have drones everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, we know he does. <laughs> right. yeah. And 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 it's amazing sometimes to see him, you know, uh, live and or being able to punch up uh, somebody else's drone footage. Um, but I really, I believe in my heart of hearts that it's, it's that it's Roland and that he is Roland everywhere. The, f the funny thing about that is I hit up Roland this morning um, on my way in to mm -hmm. the studio because like they, they, what Damon said, that was my first thing, first time seeing it was from Roland. Right. And so I text him. I'm like, hey, good morning, boss. You know, you know woo -woo, like, do you have a contact or whatever? He texts me back at 11. He's like, I was asleep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he was like, "I don't get up that early no more." I'm like, "Who posted this?" <laughs> and like, right. yes, he's got he posted it and went to bed. And he yeah. was done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he is at the stage of his life. He can just call somebody, and say, "Here's what's happening. Go do it. And, Go do or, it and be done." <laughs> or if something like this happens, know that it's your responsibility. It's to, to do it. it. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, he, he was. I was asleep. <laughs> yep. yep. Absolutely. And, and we just we we uh, you know text back and forth about the most trivial things, but um, not about the hard news stuff. But he is he is incredible, and mm -hmm. his news coverage is unparalleled. Um, let's talk about news coverage and talk about the What You Need to Know newsletter. Uh, this is our Monday through Friday newsletter in which we seek to uh, give news for and about Black folks, and uh, to inform and empower our people, as well as uh, to give some news that mainstream doesn't always give us. And, and, and for the mainstream news, it is a look and, and perhaps from a black perspective. Um, for instance, when I was talking about the Baltimore situation uh, in tomorrow's newsletter, and this is going to affect tens of thousands of people who cross that bridge every yep. day, right? And so um, thinking about that and, and how people are going to get around the DMV because this 
is a, a part of the I-695 corridor and, and, and things like that. And our people are driving and they're taking buses and, and, and what have you. So um, that is uh, how we look at things. And Cameron Riley uh, is our political contributor and writes about the loss of the U.S. House Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, diversity and inclusion, that's a term that we have come to know, especially uh, in the wake of George Floyd's death and, and now uh, in the wake of administrations like uh, the president, uh, like the governor of Florida and doing away with diversity and inclusion and a lot of other conservatives doing the same thing. Uh, but now it's, it's come to the White House or, or it's come to the House and their uh, Office of Diversity and Inclusion. So tell, tell us about it there, Cameron. Yeah, a, um, a tragedy of a different sort. Uh, we've seen the culture wars play out across the nation, starting in Florida, um, just uh, attacking higher education inst institutions for their DEI. Um, and DEI provides a space uh, for people of marginalized identities to feel welcome, to have their voices heard, to build community, and also to facilitate some sort of ad advancement. Uh, it was no surprise then that uh, after the racial reckoning that 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 was 2020, the United States uh, created the, the U.S. House uh, Office of Diversity and in, and Inclusion. And um, unlike other DEI tragedies where you, you do a little bit of digging and you find out that the, that the, that the person heading it really wasn't that qualified, uh, Dr. Sesha Joy Moon was in, incredibly qualified for this position, a very well-decorated woman with a proven track record of uh, advancing racial equity. Uh, and the defunding of the U.S. House of uh, Diversity and Inclusion was snuck into this latest spending package. Um, a lot of the talk on this on the surface was whether or not the United States was going to fund Ukraine again and who they were going to give money to to sponsor the dozens of shadow wars that the United States is, is, is fighting. Um, but little did I know uh, that it resulted in the defunding of a very important office. Um, and they do the, really uh, great things. Um, they do, yeah. And, they, and it's not just helping uh, people on Capitol Hill. Anyone can be a part of this this organization and can go there. I mean, they even they will help you with your resumes. They will uh, they they give you all kinds of information about diversity and inclusion and and uh, in, in your job searches and, and what have you. And so it really is a shame. But here's a, here's and then I know it's a thousand page bill. I get that. But somebody's right. got to do all of the the the, the dirty work. They got to be there and to parse through all of this and say. You know what something. age you're for? The aides and the all the interns right. and they, right. they, it's like here here's a hundred pages for you, hundred pages for you. Let's let's right. go. Yeah. Knock right. this out. And it might have been you know an aide that saw it and and saw no need. Uh, you know I don't know the diversity and inclusion and they could have been you know somebody who's not in favor of it and and you know and I so yeah. Yeah. Well, it's uh, anyway, everybody's credit working on that. If it wasn't on tape, then nobody's gonna read. You know how they <laughs> on tape. You know they, what's the audio book? If it wasn't the audio book, you know that should be required for all Senate and House right. uh, packages because nobody's gonna read through all that. And if you do, you're gonna miss something for sure. A thousand pages. Yeah, and and in a short period of time, you know they say, "Oh, I can go through a thousand pages," but in a matter of of uh, two or three days. Well, you'll say that, Sybil, but average humans. <laughs> uh, I, I, too, am a part of that uh, listening brigade these days and trying to double uh, to, you know, task when I'm trying to get things done and put listen to books. So, Damon, I understand. You're absolutely Sweet. right. Sweet. Uh, but it is it is a it is a tremendous task. And uh, I'm sorry that this uh, organization uh, had to pay the price for it. But I hope if they are shuttering it, they're not shutting it down completely. Because well, they're um, replacing it with the Office of uh, Talent Acquisition. Right. And um, if that sounds like HR, then you're right. Um, funny story is is that um, a lot of the studies that the uh, that the that the DEI office did, um, not only did they figure out that 60% of uh, workers on the Hill are 20 to 30 something year old white men, which mm -hmm. is ridiculous. But those that are underrepresented felt like that they weren't educated about their benefits, uh, that they didn't have any mentors or pathways to advancement. So in reality, they were doing a lot of the heavy lifting for HR, um, you know, coding it as, you know, talent management, um, 
let's see how it is that they perform. You know, let's see who they put as the leadership of the, of the, of that. Um, Dr. Sasha Joy Moon has uh, stepped down, so uh, I'm, I'm eager to see what awaits her. But uh, considering that she was, you know, working heavily scrutinized and in government for the past four years, I, I think that she is uh, well deserving of a extended vacation. Well, with a one vote majority in the House was the point I was trying to make is that I hope that they don't go far away. They're not scattered to to the hinterlands because um, with one vote majority for the Republicans in the House, it is just the matter of us voting that could turn this around mm-hmm. and and could possibly bring this back again. And, and something that is so vitally needed because as you point out, uh, what the what the statistics are as to who those aides are on Capitol Hill, <clears throat> who those aides are not, and what uh, are the openings and positions available for those if you are trying to be diverse and inclusive. I, 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 I just feel like I feel like kind of moving forward that we need to change the names of some of these things. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. When, you, yeah. When, you, when you put D, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in, that's going to be a red flag to anybody that's white. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> like, wait a minute, and it doesn't right. matter how, how conservative or how liberal you are. Doesn't matter. And, and it's like, so I'm like, you know, there's got to be a way to still implement some of these ideas and thoughts of, of because let's be honest, they're, they, they're helpful. They're, they're very helpful. Um, you know, for the white people that look at it as a way of, of putting unqualified people in just because you're a color, you know what I'm saying? You know, it's like, okay, I can see where you might think that, but then you, you, you but then it's like the, the, almost the course correction of it. It's so mm-hmm. freaking heavy mm-hmm. that it's like, wipe every, like wipe everything out and just go off of principle of the right person getting the job that don't work. <laughs> the right the right people getting the job and the, and the most qualified people getting the job never works out for people and minorities and people of color like Whether they're said, elected or not it know? doesn't it doesn't yeah. matter it's never going to work because the people that are in charge nine times out of ten are white men and what are and let's be honest you know if it was me if it was you when you hire people you hire people that you're comfortable with mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying yeah. and so when you hire people i'm a, i'm if you if i'm a higher staff probably most of them will be black, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it will be black people. And it's not because I don't want white people it's because the people that I know and the people that I trust and the people that I'm comfortable with most likely are black people. You know what I'm saying? So right. this is how it works. And so it'll never be fair. So that it, you use these, these rules to put the black faces in front of white people who are in charge for them to see something different, because if you don't, they're going to go with the status quo. And, and if what they're, they're not to. exposed, then it ain't going to happen. And they're never exposed. Yeah. I, I, I need people to understand that white people do not, for the most part in this country, don't hang around with black people outside of maybe work. And what, and the information they get from black about black people is from TV. Mm-hmm. So when they see the black person that works with them, that's different. They're like, man, you, you know, you're not like, but they don't expect more black people to be like the person that they work with. They yeah. expect them to be by, like the people that they see, the images they see on TV. So it's like once they leave work, they don't hang, they don't deal with us. <laughs> they don't deal with us at all. Unless they come from a, uh, a community like a, a, a certain white comedian. Uh, did in which he was exposed to black people and and and, and really made an act for himself. Um, so it is. It's, it's, I have it's, like two white friends lotion. who grew up in the hood, and uh, yeah. they're cool people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, and 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 oftentimes uh, they don't stay in our neighborhoods after a while. They, that they is also of, true. Kind of, you know, their parents move them along. Uh, amongst the other stories we talk about, my my passion uh, right now is about the situation in Haiti. And uh, I know that people are like, oh, enough about Haiti. There's there can never be enough about Haiti while it's in a situational crisis, and people are dying. They're starving to death. They're being killed. And it is unfortunate, it is not even the word that we should be used. It is tragic that uh, this is going on and very little is being done. So please take a look at my story on Haiti as well as another life-saving uh, article in the Black Health Matters column. And that is about colorectal cancer. It affects us, of course, disproportionately, uh, greater rates than other uh, ethnicities. And our CPA to the stars, Katrina Kraft, unlocks what you need to know about your 401k. If I if I could just briefly about Haiti, 
um, about Port de Prince, yeah. uh, specifically. Um, it's just like uh, people are people are wondering how a um, military grade equ equ equipment is finding itself on an island that doesn't create or manufacture machine guns. Um, they're American made weapons. Uh, so when you think about gun rights and gun activism and gun access, it goes a whole lot deeper uh, than mass shootings. It goes a lot. It goes a lot deeper toward arms dealers who are supplying. Um, and not necessarily countries. all Americans. Right. Yes. Um, because they they have a way of dealing with foreign other foreign countries as well. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. And it is, it's enough is enough. I, I, I'm sorry I'm rushing through this, but I, we have a very special guest and I'm really um, excited about what's really going on. Um, our girlfriend, Dr. Sonia Marks is here to talk about health disparities, especially as it relates to black women. Over the last few months, much of the world was consumed, much of the world, not including us, uh, was consumed by the, uh, the surgery of Great Britain's Princess Kate. There was little to no information coming out of the palace, but last week the princess revealed a post-operative cancer was discovered, and that was it. Um, in the meanwhile, Jessica Petaway, a 36-year-old beauty influencer known for her hair tutorials on YouTube, passed away March 11th in hospice after battling cervical cancer. So here's the background on this, and this is why I want Dr. Marks here today, and I want to talk to you uh, guys as partners, as spouses, as family members of women, uh, and how we can be best serve a women as advocates in situations like this. After being misdiagnosed with fibroids for months, Jessica Petaway was hospitalized for extreme bleeding and abdominal pain that she referred to as labor-like. She was a mother of two, a married mother of two. She was finally referred to an oncologist who diagnosed her with stage three cervical cancer. And parenthetically, black women are 41% more likely to develop cervical cancer than white women and 75% more likely to die from it, according to the National Library of Medicine. Her misdiagnosis is a sad and, and, and current reminder of the countless ways of healthcare system fails patients. And, and so Dr. Marks, thank you for joining us. And as a uh, OBGYN, I thought it was especially uh, timely for you to uh, come on and to talk about, to talk about not only cervical cancer, but, and, and, and how it affects us, but also how, what can we do uh, as girlfriends of Jessica Petway, of, of the family of Jessica Petway to help her as she is suffering. I mean, su at one point, she was hospitalized, and this is when they diagnosed the fibroids. She was found by her husband unconscious, and he took her to the hospital, and they diagnosed fibroids. And it seemingly was, they knew something was not right, but fibroids couldn't be, you know, killing her the way that this was. So um, first of all, Dr. Marks, I know there's a lot, but thank you for joining us, and also, um, what are your thoughts on this in terms of uh, the kind of care and, and the kind of, uh, I guess, advocacy that we need to uh, promote? So first, hi, Subo. Hi, gentlemen. Um, so yes, you know, and my thoughts and prayers are with, the, you know, Ms. Petaway's family and all the ones who love her and, you know, supported her on social media. But definitely, you know, not necessarily knowing all the specifics of her medical history, but it still highlights the importance of, uh, you know, preventative care and routine maintenance going in for just your regular checkups. Um, so especially with cervical cancer of the gynecologic cancers, that's actually the only one that we can, you know, prevent and detect early through routine screening tests. So like of all the cancers that women get, that's actually the one that we have some type of early testing that can help prevent the pro progression to actual cer um, cervical cancer and catch it early enough to where you typically have better outcomes than what she underwent. So, you know, the main thing would be, you know, going for regular checkups and getting appropriate screening through your pap smears and um, we have HPV DNA testing and then it also highlights the importance of 
you know, getting the HPV vaccine. I know a lot of people are, you know, have their thoughts about vaccines, but, you know, the HPV vaccine has actually been shown to be very helpful in preventing cervical cancer. And, you know, actually um, it's important, since we have the men on too, it's actually important for young girls and boys to get vaccinated for HPV um, because there's also an increase in head and neck cancer through um, basically getting throat cancer caused by HPV virus um, through oral sex. So, you know, the men aren't, you know, you know, they have their part in, in prevention also. So definitely it just highlights, you know, the need for us going and getting our checkups. Like Princess Kate, we know she's going to get excellent she's care. She's going to the best. Yeah. You're right. And so, I, you know, and I think just our numbers are so disproportionate, probably more so because of access, lack of access, you know, either through not having adequate, not, not being adequately insured. Um, you know, we have uh, inadequate numbers of physicians uh, to, you know, provide those services like here in Georgia. Um, I think out of the 159 counties, um, there are 82 without OBGYNs. And then there's another 15 that only have one. And so, you know, that's, you know, woefully inadequate. And then, you know, as Cameron spoke to, when you have these anti-DEI um, measures, you know, that also affects, you know, those of us who would, you know, otherwise go into medicine and be the ones to be committed to taking care of people in our committee or in our communities. So, um, you know, things like that end up disproportionately affecting us and hurting um, our women as far as the type of care that we receive. And, and where we're going to get the care, um, because as you and I talked about, um, sometimes the ERs are so understaffed and they, and, and they don't have people who are going to take the, who look like you and I are going to take the time to try to figure this out. And, right. and, and yeah, and even, I guess, you know, and I guess what I did kind of see from, you know, some of the details of what may have happened to her, um, you know, going, when we go into the emergency room, um, even if you're having a pelvic exam as a woman, that doesn't automatically mean you're getting a pap smear. You know, right. a pelvic exam is just basically looking for whatever you think is emergent going on at that time. So even if they put in a speculum, even if they, you know, the physician examines you with your their hands, it doesn't mean that you've had like a full evaluation for potentially detecting, you know, uh, surgery cervical cancer, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, you know, any of the cancers that we can be subjected to. So, um, so, you know, that's, I think, a caveat that I have for women, because a lot of, you know, I get patients all the time who think because they've had an exam or a speculum exam, that means they've had a pap smear. And mm -hmm. that's not the case. Even if you go into the office for a, a specific um, issue, um, and you have a pelvic exam that still doesn't mean that you've had an actual pap smear or the you know cervical cancer screen. because some of us don't know what that entails right right and 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 so um we have to we have to be vigilant about explaining what that is what it looks like what it uh, and oftentimes <laughs> what it feels like uh, right. and 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 how that is how important that is in saving our lives right yeah, so the pap smear is actually us, you know, scraping cells of the cervix or having an HPV DNA testing. Those, you know, you're actually sampling cells from the cervix. So just because we put the speculum in and we just look and you don't feel us doing anything else, see us doing anything else, or sometimes if we're doing um, STD testing, you know, we might be using swabs or Q-tips, but we're still not necessarily doing an actual pap smear, you know, with screen for cervical cancer. So, you know, that's why it's important just to, you know, feel comfortable enough to have that relationship and trust with your physician or caretaker that you're able to ask those questions to know exactly what's being done. Or if it's not being done, that you're comfortable enough to ask for it or advocate for yourself and say that right. I feel like, you know, I need this. I haven't, I don't know if I've been, you know, screened for cervical cancer, you know, you know, just to be, have comfortable enough to have those conversations 
and be able to advocate for yourself as a patient. And, you know, we used to joke in the uh, on the old Joiner show that when we started to take a loved one for the like, take a loved one to the doctor day, it was the women who insisted that their men get uh, get to the doctor and take care of, of whatever medical challenges they had. But in this case, I'm talking to the guys that, you know, your woman, your mom, your sister, your your partner in life may be in need of an advocate, somebody to push a little bit harder and to demand that these tests are taken, that uh, that answers are given, and and not just to kind of say, well, it looks like, no, send me to somebody who's going to tell me what it is, as opposed to what it looks like, and 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 you don't want to think about it as ignorance, but uh, some doctors, I mean, I just read a story, Dr. Marks, about Halle Berry, mm -hmm. Halle Berry. Uh, was having uh, difficulties uh, uh, in her doctor, and she was in extreme pain when she was having sex with her new boyfriend. And her doctor told her that she had an STD. And it turns out she was premenopausal that caused the pain when she was having sex. And so, you know, almost broke her up with her boyfriend because, you know, it's like, you exposed me to this. We have to go and get tested. They both got tested and neither had an STD. And then upon, you know, further review, someone said, you are, a, another doctor said, you're premenopausal. These are one of the symptoms of, you know, a dryness. And it causes, it causes, she says, it's like knives, you know, stabbing uh, her. And, and so while they were having sex. And so these things, we know that you guys don't know everything, but we do want to know that you have a, a pretty good idea of what's going on, especially down there, um, you know, in terms of, of our lives, right? And Yeah, and sometimes it takes, you know, a series of exams or a series of evaluations to, like, figure out exactly what's going on. Sometimes we, we can't don't know necessarily just from one visit, so that's also why it's important to have, you know, that relationship with a, you know, provider that you're comfortable with that, you know, you feel comfortable that they're going to do their due diligence. And then, you know, that you're able to be persistent, like, well, no, I don't think this is it. And, you know, I'm still having symptoms that, you know, you're comfortable enough to go back or, you know, sometimes you have to go outside and get another physician or a second opinion, whatever. But, you know, to, to, I guess, to our defense, sometimes we can't just figure it all out in one right. day. But, um, but you want some, but you want to feel like you have someone that's going to care enough to like keep at it until, you know, we have the right answer and the right treatment. And Med, you're lucky because your wife is a nurse, right? You're, you're, you're muted, Don. Um, but your wife is a nurse. And so, I mean, you might not have to be the advocate so much for her, although it would be nice if, but do you think that you're capable of, of pushing forward if she were to get a diagnosis that she felt uncomfortable with? Uh, yeah. I, well, no, if, if, she, if she feels uncomfortable with it, mm -hmm. um, yeah, because she would kill me if I didn't. Um, <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's, it's crazy because, you know, with, with my wife being a nurse practitioner, uh, being in the medical field for 20 years, um, she don't trust nobody. In the medical field. It really is. It's like she, like their first, like the whenever she, whatever their first diagnosis is, she's like, yeah, okay, let me get a second opinion. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it, it's never just okay. The doctor said this. We're gonna do this. She here's what the doctor says, and then she goes and researches it herself, and then you know she'll come up with what she thinks, and then she'll probably go see another doctor on top of that, and then with all the information she gets, then she moves forward. With the discussion, but if she never, if she doesn't feel comfortable with anything or something, uh, oh, please believe everyone will know. <laughs> right. And that's awesome because a lot of times when people are in a profession, they tend not to take care of themselves. Like you see a lot of hairstylists with messed up hair. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you see a lot of barbers with jacked up froze, you know, so. <laughs> I'm just trying to add a little levity to this little you, segment. You're doing your job. You're doing your and job. I also wanted to ask, uh, is there signs that we as men, I mean, we already down there. Is there something we should be looking for? I mean, I'm speaking for myself, I'm already down there. Um, <laughs> while I'm down there, is there something I can do to help or feel or touch or 
taste or smell. I'm just saying. <laughs> Y'all laughing. See, this is a serious question. I'm trying to keep my wife healthy. I'm just saying my eyes are closed usually during that time. So should I keep my eyes open? <laughs> but it, the, <laughs> the question is, <laughs> lights are usually off. I can't see nothing. I'm just, I'm right. going to feel. I'm sorry. See what you've yeah. done? This is not, this is That's what I'm, Yeah, you know, because sometimes you look and it's looking right back at you. You feel a little embarrassed. I understand. <laughs> So, so, Dr. Marks, I have heard stories where women have discovered lumps in their breasts because their men were feeling their breasts and discovered, you know, something was amiss, something that they missed. So is there is that the kind of thing that we can encourage men to to be a part of and to, to find something or if something doesn't feel quite right? I mean, yeah, that's absolutely, you know, there's absolutely a, a place for that because I have had patients that come in, just like you said, well, you know, my significant other, my husband felt this lump in my breast or, you know, he's complaining that I have, you know, vaginal odor or, the, you know, there's this weird discharge. Is this normal? So, um, you know, so definitely there's a place for that because, you know, you all notice your things that, you know, you notice and, you know, we notice the things about ourselves. But as far as, um, I guess, cervical cancer, you know, as far as like early changes, abnormalities of the cervix, there aren't necessarily, um, you know, things that are automatically noticeable, but, you know, you can have, you know, abnormal discharge, you can have vaginal bleeding, even having spotting after sexual intercourse. So some sometimes that's like the most common um, complaint that we get to know that we need to like investigate and like really look at the cervix. Because even a lot of times with early uh, changes of the cervix, you can't visibly see it with the mm -hmm. eye. So that's why we take the sample to, to like take cells and then send them off to be looked at under the microscope. But, you know, spotting after sex definitely is a sometimes a common early um, symptom that something unusual is or abnormal is maybe going on with the cervix. So abnormal bleeding, pain, abnormal discharge, bleeding after sex would definitely be things that can help, you know, give a hint that something's not right. And would you recommend that we act as advocates, not only for our partners, but for our girlfriends? I know in one case, um, you were you were very helpful with a friend of ours who was going through uh, a gynecological issue, and it was it was reassuring that the uh, information she was given you corroborated and you you agreed with the, the method of of treatment and what have you. That's uh, having an advocate is really really important, I believe. Oh, absolutely. Because even, you know, just for myself or my family members, you know, I definitely have family members that are calling me from like the delivery room. Like, I have you on speaker. You need to talk about my doctor. <laughs> um, or, um, and even just for myself, like, even if it's something that's not obstetric or gynecologic, you know, I have people that I call or curbside all the time, like, uh, oh, you know, I'm feeling this or I'm concerned about, this. you know, so definitely having an adequate, I have people advocate. I have, have people that keep me on track, you know, um, to Damon's point, there was like, uh, a couple of years that I went that I didn't realize that I hadn't gone in for my own, you know, uh, yeah. annual GYN. Exams. And, you know, when I went in, they were like, oh, you know, you're like two years behind. I'm like, no, I was just here last year. And they like pulled out the records to <laughs> show that mm -hmm. it was almost a three year gap that I had gone myself. So, because you're so busy taking care of everybody else that you right. forget to, you know, take care of yourself. And the other part of that was the pandemic, you know, right. that, you know, we just, uh, people were, were just removing themselves from that for the time being. Um, mm -hmm. I want to thank you so much for this. And I think that um, if we, if nothing else we take from this is that we advocate for those in our lives the way we wish that Jessica had had people advocate for her. And I'm not saying her husband didn't um, because he was there by her side uh, for every event. But um, sometimes we just need, the advocate needs an advocate. Right. And just, you know, like you said, like you've been saying, just everybody go for their regular yeah. checkups because that's the best 
form of prevention is just staying up to date with your care, you know, because when you're going in in emergent circumstances, and especially if you do go in for an emergency and there's something that, that they're concerned about, just make sure you follow up with right. your regular physician. Don't yeah. just count on going for these emergent visits and, and think that that's, you know, encompassing the full scope of the care that you need because it may not be. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. I don't know how much you're going to bill me for this, but I really appreciate it. It's worth it. All you <laughs> appreciate you, darling. Thank you so much. Have a good night. You too. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's very interesting, uh, Sybil, because I was uh, kind of reminded of something. When, when my mom was sick with cancer, you know, my dad, it's not that my dad didn't advocate. My dad didn't know what to mm -hmm. ask. You know what I'm saying? You know, again, my mom was in the medical field as well. But her brother, who was a doctor, mm. boy, oh boy, he told my father, hey, send me every scan she gets. Wow. Send me every contact for her doctors that she has. And it was basically he would see, he would go over the charts that my dad would get, send it to her, send it to him, go over the charts, and he would call the doctors himself. Yeah. And he was, he was just like, are you doing this? Are you doing this? What else can she, you know, what else can we do? Because that was his specialty. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So it was just one of those things where, um, you know, you know, where it's it's when it comes to advocating for your family members, sometimes if you don't know, go find someone who does. Right. Um, especially if they look like us, you right. know, not to not to sound like that. But, it, it, you know, we will we will look after each other before somebody else will. Because I've I've dealt with doctors even recently with my dad's diagnosis mm -hmm. of uh, of I had to change the doctor because I'm like, and I literally almost said to his face, you're an asshole. I don't like <laughs> I don't like this tone that I'm getting from you. Right. And it was funny because he'd always whenever we I take him to get his biopsy or his your know, urological care, um, it was like the doctor would either want to move our appointment or, you know, have to leave early or stuff like that. And then one day uh, Dr. Chen came in, was talking to us and I'm like, hey, can you replace him? Right. And he's like, well, if you want to see me, yeah, oh, yeah, we want to see you. Yeah. <laughs> I want I want to see you. Yeah. And and so sometimes you just got to especially go with your gut because I've never been in, put in that situation. But I, just talking to the man, I was like, I don't like you, and it's, it's time to to change. Right. So sometimes you just got to make yeah. a move, uh, something for to be said about like all of these. Um, hang on one second, we... Cameron. H hang on to that thought. We're gonna move to trending, uh, and oh. and because this conversation is trending, um, mm -hmm. we're gonna move to that. And and so uh, just to to bookmark this, uh, Cameron, you were gonna say what? Oh, I was just going to say that how we keep uh, importing all of this medical talent, you know, people who don't have any experience in working with, you know, black people, um, you know, they come and get these very high paying specialized positions, but they have absolutely no empathy uh, for who we are or where it is that we, or where it is that we come from. You know, they don't prioritize us. Uh, they don't care. Um, and that really shows up in the quality of, 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 of work that they uh, mm -hmm. that they do from accurately re reporting data to, you know, even, you know, surgeries, uh, sucks to see. I'm going to say again, they don't be around us. <laughs> they don't know. Like, honestly, it's like, we, we can, we can call it racism. We can call it whatever we want, but I'm just, it's mostly ignorance. Mm -hmm. They don't, they're not around us. They're, they don't, they don't see us but except for what they see on TV. They, or may bump into us at work. But when it comes to dealing with us on a day-to-day -day basis of understanding where we come from, they have no clue, no clue whatsoever, based only off of what they kind of know from what they see on TV, man. And if they, if you compound that with if they do any type of ER work or or, or uh, triage, then they see the lower belly of our society because there's gunshot wounds and it's fighting mm. and it's ignorant and it's not us that who are you know a professional people that they're exposed to. So they, I mean, they begin come to be dismissive at a point. Yep, very much so. That's really interesting. Um, this is a conversation I hope that we'll continue to have and, and talk about not only getting the proper care, but also helping others get the proper care as well. Cameron, do you feel comfortable in, in acting as an advocate for your family? Yeah, I mean, I, I know too much about the social determinants of health to not to. Um, <laughs> my... Um... <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna call Cameron when I feel <laughs> I'm gonna social just, determinants of health. Yeah. Let them, yeah. Hey, let them know. Hey, you tell. I'm trying. I'm getting mad. You tell them, Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> it's just uh, the the obstacle that that I see um, when um, my mom is caring for 
uh, our elders, what my aunt is caring mm-hmm. for our, our elders is just navigating how complicated the healthcare system has become. I right. mean, you know, she'll spend hours at, uh, at a day just waiting on hold to get an appointment and then shopping with the different insurance people and, yeah. you know, doctors forgetting that they even saw her. And I mean, navigating the healthcare system nowadays is just, has just really become, I mean, you, you got to take off work to book an appointment and then take off work to go to the appointment. It's the, it's the, it's the worst. Yeah. It is. Really um, and, and, and not, not just doctors. I had a, a, a friend tell me about a situation in which uh, it was the nurse that was not treating them with the level of respect that, that they were accustomed to. And they had to speak to the doctor about changing the nurse uh, in order to get what, what she needed. And so it is, uh, it, it just behooves us to stay on top of our game and to be that person for our people. Right. And I can tell you this, the white people get rid of the nurses just because they color all the time. Happens with my wife. She told yeah. me this all the time. She's like, hey, the man, the woman didn't want me to th- take care of her. So I'm like, Godspeed. Godspeed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Not a problem at all. That happens all the time where they don't want black professionals to take care of them. Yeah. So, you know, it is what it is. It is. Yeah, we should well. free, up, free up the black people to take care of us. Exactly. <laughs> Lord knows <laughs> we need them. Um, let's talk about what's going on. Uh, Damon, you mentioned that you are on your way to Edmonton and you're coming back. You got a big weekend and, uh, and, and going to help out, uh, our friend Coco Brown. Uh, yes, uh, uh literally, um, uh, what we're doing is it's almost like a comedy, uh, fundraiser. You know, I, I booked her just specifically so we could put some money in her pocket and get her, you know, toward her recovery from her house fire. Not to play on that, she's already a super talented comedian. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you're coming for a great time, but you also can help by coming. But if you can't make it, you can buy a ticket. You can go on DamonWilliamsComedy.com and get a ticket if you want to help support that. Um, but also G Thing, who just filmed a groundbreaking special, uh, is coming to town just to work out because now after we do a special, you got to get more jokes. So he's coming to do that. Uh, Howie Bell is coming in and a lot of Chicago comedians. I also want to acknowledge and, 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 and just give kudos to Just Niche. Tanisha Rice, oh. we just we just attended her taping at the Chicago Improv, a, a self-funded special that she did a, a you know, crowdsourcing and we filmed it and we and she slayed it. First, it's very groundbreaking, it's innovative. She did a selfie style where it's the camera is over her shoulder looking mm-hmm. at the audience and there's other aspects to it that have never been done. So it's, once it hits, she is out of here. Trust me, because she nailed it flawlessly. So shouts out to Just Niche. Where do and, I know Just uh, yeah. Niche from? Uh, that name sounds familiar. Where do I know her from? Is there, she from does stuff online? From doing comedy. Yeah. I just feel like Just Niche, I've, I've heard her before. When she, was in, she was in Atlanta. She's been in Atlanta for a couple of months uh, writing for Miss Pat. For the Miss Pat show, she was on the heart of the city with with Kevin Hart, but she's been grinding since day one. So my wife and I have really uh, we sort of adopted her the first right. time we saw her. We're, we're her like her godparents, and mm-hmm. to see our baby flourish, she is killing the game. So look out for that. And yeah. I got to tell you, um, a lot of comedians claim it, but uh, Damon is a man of action when it comes to encouraging Absolutely. female comedians and uh, you know Absolutely. nourishing them, as he said, and and helping them grow and and take it to the next level as as he has demonstrated so good on you thank you sir thank you um, yeah i'm an advocate for the ladies in comedy and i've never dated a lady comedian just put that out there too and you're probably a, a healthier man for it too <laughs> well you know a lot of times guys if, especially if it's an attractive comedian they'll try to book them thinking if they fly right. in that you know the whole cast and couch mentality so I, that's never the case here i just think there needs to be a, more of a voice oh, in the God. comedian world hold on my wife just came in and made a comment. Who? Me. Oh, my wife said, yes, I have. Him. <laughs> well, I married one, but I never dated one. <laughs> yeah, I, my wheels start turning like, hold on. <laughs> um, <laughs> Show me the Carfax. That is hilarious. She is funny, and her timing is excellent. And you say that all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, man. Oh, I, I man. thought I was in trouble again. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, a horrific uh, collapse of the uh, bridge in the, uh, in, uh, the Baltimore 
uh, court overnight happened about 1 30 this morning and i always think that the worst things that can happen are like hurricanes or or tornadoes landing in the middle of the night in in pitch darkness and this is the case where a uh, a thousand foot long cargo boat was carrying vehicles they were on their way from baltimore to sri lanka mm -hmm. and there there appeared to be some sort of power problem on the boat they said the lights flashed on and off. Mm -hmm. And then um, the whoever was uh, manning the communications device said Mayday, called out Mayday. And it was that Mayday that may have saved untold, no, uh, untold numbers of lives of people who were crossing the bridge. And they said one person had the presence of mind to stop the traffic. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there was a group of construction workers who made it past his point uh, before May Day was declared. And uh, they are now presumed to be lost. Mm -hmm. um, and and they, they spent, you know, from the time this happened, as, as I said, it was 1.30 in the morning. So mm -hmm. figure about 1.45 until, uh, until dark uh, today. And uh, the crews were searching um, uh, emergency technicians and what have you and, and uh, all of the folks uh, with the Marines and the Navy and, and what have you, uh, trying to find out if they could find these people. One person, uh, two people were recovered. One person didn't even uh, require a hospital stay. A second person is, I believe, still in the hospital. Um, but this uh, caused this, as the boat hit to the, the important part of this bridge, of this span, um, the whole thing just collapsed. It was almost like it was like it was aluminum foil or something. Yeah. Just, kinda, just all, you know, submerged into the water in the frigid waters of mm -hmm. the Pepsco River, along with people and vehicles. And uh, as I said, over the last hour, six people to be uh, believed to be a part of the construction crew. They were out there to repair potholes on the bridge are now presumed dead. Uh, and um, it is it's horrific. And 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 one thing that I point out in in the story is that you know everybody says uh, the pres when the president uh, Biden came into office, he said one of my goals is going to be to improve the infrastructure yeah. of this country. And unfortunately, you don't get a lot of it's not a sexy improvement to make, right? But it is our roadways, it's our bridges that are that need all of this improving. Or, or to do over. You don't want to wait till a horrific event like happened in Minnesota where the bridge just collapses. Collapse on on its own. Project, right? yeah. Or, or the or train that, tracks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and so, you know, there's something about this that is going to affect so, this one event, as horrific as it is, is going to have a ripple effect upon people and their tr modes of travel for six, 10, 12 months. Yeah. As they rebuilt, because it was such an important part of the uh, Interstate 695, uh, they said tens of thousands of cars going over this bridge back and forth to work. The entire DMV is going to be affected by this. Um, you know, like I said, talking about it this morning, like like basically four hours after it happened, and we were still kind of gathering information, and you know, no one really knew what to say. There was no press conferences yet right. at the time. Um, you know, to to. to watch it at first i'm thinking when i first saw it was like did this thing just collapse on its right. own yeah. and then you see it again as the boat and how the boat hit it and, it, and please believe me in the studio this morning we were asking a whole bunch of questions because it was like why because at first the boat the boat doesn't look like it's small enough to get underneath the right bridge. right and i'm like is that boat even supposed to be there you know what right. i'm saying i don't know how the 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 ship and the docks and where everything is and, and then to see how it just perfectly hit that last stanchion mm -hmm. um, to to knock out and to watch it just crumble like that was yeah. insane. Well, I, I saw an interview where an uh, engineer, uh, structural engineer expert, had said that the way that bridge was built and how long ago it was built was not uh, conducive with the size of the tankers that have increased and, mm -hmm. and the, the cargo that goes mm -hmm. underneath it nowadays. And that's why they were supposed to be fortifying the, the bridge at some point. But even back to Obama's initial uh, term, he was talking infrastructure and trying to do infrastructure yeah. bills, and, and the Republicans were against it just because it was him saying it. Yeah. So it's it's very unfortunate, and it's unfortunate for like for anybody that was like not supposed to be where they were last night, and they couldn't get home. 
because he was on the other side of the bridge and she like, where are you? <laughs> Baby, you're not going to believe it. Baby, you're not going to believe it. <laughs> the bridge is gone. What? You, you said you was going down. to your mama's house. Your <laughs> mama don't live you. on the other side of that bridge, sir. Oh, man. <laughs> God, no. You are caught up now. If your ass was on the other side of the bridge, you're supposed to be over here, and you way a, a mile across the bridge. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't realize that the uh, the cargo was vehicles. Yeah. It would have been a shame for it to be something trivial like a, a, a sheen shipment, you know, of a bunch of outfits that only ladies can wear one time, and then they throw them to, to the garbage. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it could have been a big Sheen Timu <laughs> shipment. <laughs> <laughs> bunch of wish.com items and took out a whole bridge. That would be an additional tragedy to this story. <laughs> In this case, it was just cars. Too soon? Too soon? I'm sorry. I'm here for levity, people. Yes, I'm and here. You're, and you're doing a fine job of keeping the, keeping us uplifted. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we have run out of time uh, for this segment, but I do want to thank you guys in, in the conversation. Uh, but we have got to talk about, um, if not this week, we've got to talk about Diddy. And uh, I think it's still going to be going on uh, as, as the week goes on. But I, I do want to uh, acknowledge that we're not ignoring it. It's just time is not our friend here. Um, yeah. And 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 it just keeps happening, and it's just you know it's just and, and another thing and another we thing. Don't be talking about it. I thought I told you that we won't stop. I thought I told you that we won't stop. <laughs> <laughs> Man, uh, yeah. Again, like I said, it was a busy day uh, <laughs> on for radio today. Uh, the Diddy situation is just. Um, I, I said this uh, about Diddy. If there was anything that the feds could get that were in his homes. Oh, you know that he did not get rid of over the last three months. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, since Cassie, since that whole cat, since the whole Cassie thing happened, there should be nothing that the Fed should be getting out of his house. That's they probably didn't. It was all on that plane. Why do you think the plane flew with no problem? <laughs> yeah. Whatever you do, get this plane out. Of it's all type of fucking <laughs> DNA and everything. Get that plane out the country. I'm telling you, the cages that are in the basement, they were all cleared out, put pit bulls in there and, and got the and got the human beings out of there. You know what I'm saying? He cleared everything out, man. Wow. They, they, they better have because that, you know, he, he he knew that it was over from then. You haven't heard from Diddy. You haven't seen Diddy, uh, honestly, since what November, October. Yeah, he was busy destroying evidence. He's been he's been well, He's, he's like, been busy uh, getting rid of his business. Clearing he stuff just, up. He, he just yeah. sold his uh, his uh, share of Revolt, and that yeah. deal went through today as well. Putting stuff in his mama's name, his kid's name. Yeah, <laughs> he's he been cleaning up. He's been cleaning up. I mean, if last. half the stories about Diddy are true, this, this is karma just taking this slow, sweet time getting to him. Wow. Yeah. It's been a lot of lot of bad things that have been seventy five percent. I believe about seventy five percent. Let's turn yeah. to something a little uh, brighter in uh, entertainment. And congratulations to Tiffany Haddish. She reveals that she's been sober for the last several months following her uh, DUI arrest last fall. Uh, she revealed on a podcast she's been sober, and she said, "I haven't drank any alcohol, smoked any weed, or anything in like seventy two days." Nice. Very okay. nice. And she it's said, handy. let's go. And she said, it's not hard. It's not that hard for me because it really wasn't like my main thing. And what asked what prompted her to stop consuming alcohol and weed, she said, being obedient to the law. She said the yeah, judge okay. told her she had to quit. And she said it's court mandated, uh, referencing her two DUI arrests mm. and said she only smoked weed to manage the pain that's associated with her uh, ongoing battle against endometriosis. Mm. Um, and so, and, and she said a lot of this had to do with just fatigue. She was going and going and going and, and what may have been a little weed or a little alcohol just, com you know, combined with her fatigue. And that's why, you know, they found her car running in the middle of a street in, in Beverly Hills because she had just become, that's, that's just, and and it was, but it was also, it was also Friday after Thanksgiving. It was itis. I <laughs> Yeah, who amongst us wasn't a little drowsy that Friday? That's right. Hey, Sybil, look here. From a man who slept sleepy thousands of times, uh -huh. uh, that's worse than being drunk. <laughs> I'm like, you, hey. add, a little, you yeah. add a little weed and a little alcohol to being tired? Oh, no. It's, no, no, it's no. Well no, documented no. in my life that I was sober when I fell asleep and had an accident. So, mm -hmm. you know, it can happen. Trust me. Yeah. All the, man. 
I had one of those events and I was sleepy uh, driving home and it was still light out um, just Friday evening. And I was so scared. I like turned on, you know, the air conditioner up mm -hmm. had the windows open and the sky uh, roof open. And because I just felt myself just kind of, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's frightening. It really and is. And I want to tell people in those instances, don't try to fight that. The only solution to that is to pull over yeah. and get out your car because the air in, in, inside your car and, you know, get out, stand up, Walk jog around down, the show that you have to walk around yeah. the car because you're not, you can't beat it. And it's, it's a silent, it sneaks up on you and before you know it. Now, cars are more technologically advanced where they kind of give you a, a little scare yeah, and lane juggle, control. Yeah, yeah. my car is yeah, not but, technically advanced, it's an old. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you, 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 so. you always yeah. get the hell out yeah. the car and walk around a little bit, get the yeah. air in your face. Yeah. Cause right. and sometimes you can dream you a lot you awake driving. Right, right. <laughs> yes. I drove to Chicago once tired from Atlanta, and it was just yeah. me and Jesus. And that's how we made it. It was because, <laughs> wow. yeah. you know, because driving to the mountains of Tennessee, that's not fun. No. And like you said, uh, Sybil, leaving like leaving the studio at 12 o'clock and the sun's bright out. I was driving mm -hmm. home in Chicago, driving home, and uh, I thought I blinked. I just thought I blinked. Right. And next thing you know, I was driving back into the city. I was just like, why is the Sears Tower back wow. in, in front of me? I had I had no recollection of getting off, turning around, and coming back, right. uh, going back into the city. I just, I said, man, I blinked a couple times, and next thing you know, I'm driving, I'm going back <laughs> i really say i really say sleepy driving is more hazardous than drunk driving because you know drunk, typically, yeah they typically get home like you can snap out a drunk you know you might knock off a mirror you know <laughs> everybody's been a little tipsy everybody's made that little turn close to the curb all right yep all right I think I'm a little drunk yeah, yeah. but that sleepy it's a silent sneaky thing man so yeah. get out the car i'm telling you pull over find a gas station or a hotel or a safe space I had a trooper tell me once, he said, I see you fighting it, man. He said, look, you're at a rest stop. You're safe here. We're watching you. Take a nap. Because cause he saw me. I was outside the car doing a little right. jumping jack. Because yeah. I used to do a Sunday night in Milwaukee every a month. And I would drive home after the show every mm -hmm. time. And that was just ill-advised. And I had the same thing uh, driving from Wisconsin to Chicago. I was working at a TV station. And all of a sudden, I saw the animals from Jurassic Park coming towards me. <laughs> the animals, the, the, the animals on the, the, the yeah. stoplight yeah. on the expressway has, has gotten me a couple times. They were all coming at me. And I was like, yeah. oh, I got to stop. I the hallucinations yeah. when you're tired. Like, my wife is asking, what are you doing? Stoplight. What? <laughs> <laughs> We're on the expressway. I'm sorry. Let me pull over for a second. This time, the and that stoplight is that stoplight is not your friend either. Because I've had an occasion. I swear, I've had a lot of them misses. Where you know you see that yellow light, you're like, oh, red. Yeah, I can go ahead and uh, close it down. <laughs> and I drifted right through the intersection. <laughs> I looked up. I had already. I'm like, oh, okay, all right, yeah, terrible. all right, yeah, awful. Don't do Woo. it. Yep. Don't Thank God it. they have the, the little ruffles on the shoulder of the highway. Those keep you up sometimes, too. Yeah, hey, my true. life once. That's true. Um, yeah. We're going to close out with uh, Yogi's Jewel. Good health enables us to enjoy our lives with min minimal physical limitations. Let me do that again. Good health enables us to enjoy our lives with minimal physical limitations. Uh, we are talking about good health and life's essential eight. Check out our program. Coming up on Thursday evening with uh, Guy Tory talking about Life's Essential Eight and our uh, representative of the American Heart Association. Thank you guys so much. It's been a great show. I appreciate you. And we'll see you all again next week. Take care. Aloha. Aloha.